Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name's John Murphy. Uh, I work for Kmart Australia in the servers and storage team. Uh, my job is I do a little bit of Windows, a little bit of Linux, and a whole lot of network monitoring. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about rational configuration design to prevent irrational problem solving. Um, this discussion, and it is a discussion, it's sort of very philosophical in nature. Uh, we sort of go through, I think everyone, the first time they do a Nagios deployment, they get it wrong. I know I did like three times, uh, to be honest. And it takes a little while before you eventually work out what works for you. So I'd like to introduce you to a sort of uh, a, a technique that I use, and it should be suitable, I think, for most uh, medium to large sized organizations. Um, now, there's no, because it's sort of a philosophical discussion, there's no right or wrong answers. Uh, what works for me probably isn't going to work for, say, a consultancy, where you've got a lot of distribution in your network and a lot of distribution in uh, where those sort of, uh, the monitoring is going to take place. Uh, for Kmart, obviously, we have stores, but it's, it's still a very sort of different environment, a different dynamic in how you're deciding where to send those alerts to and how you've got to configure your services and your hosts. Uh, so let's, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, I'm going to talk about two separate topics. Uh, in the basic topic, we're going to talk about the relationship between your contacts, your hosts, and your services. Uh, now, it's very important that I put contacts at the top of this list. Uh, I firmly believe that the contact is probably the most important of the three objects. Uh, to understand why, we're going to begin by putting on our web developer hat, perhaps our web developer scarf. I don't have any more web developer gear. This is uh, sort of all I have. Uh, so, so the most important aspect of Web 2.0 development is what? Don't, don't, don't everyone jump off a what? The hat. It's not the hat. <laughs> it's close. Close enough. It's the hat. Um, the most important aspect is, you know, making it nice and user-friendly and usable, you know, all those fun little Ajax objects, the swishy thing as it loads stuff, and those, those nice little animations while it you know, fades to the next page. It's all those, those niceties that make it easy for the user to sort of see what's going on. Um, the next and second most important rule of uh, our Web 2.0 development is what? It's the scarf, absolutely right. It is the scarf. And it's also that if we have time, we might actually make the application work. So we'll go through sort of hosts and services. Uh, once, we, once we get past that, we'll uh, look at some more advanced concepts. I use the term advanced rather loosely here, but advanced in terms of, you know, above contacts, hosts, and services. And we'll talk a little bit about the parents and the dependencies. Uh, we'll talk about managing exceptions in your configuration and we'll talk about automation. Uh, most of this sort of stuff, we'll just be going through some, some little real world examples uh, that a lot of you are probably going to encounter or encounter similar situations. So as I go through the basic configuration, I want you to keep this little diagram in your head. Uh, we have an Nagios server, we have some network stuff, we have an exchange server. I presume you have more in your network, but for this, let's just, let's just keep it simple. And we have some users who are interested in our network things and some users who are interested in our exchange server. Uh, this is pretty much a standard team environment, right? You have your server group or your Linux team and you have your network team and you have your middleware team and they all sort of only care about their little corner of the IT world. So let's begin talking about contacts. Uh, when I talk about contact objects, there's actually two very important distinctions I like to make. Uh, the first is an actual contact. Now that is a contact object that has an email address or an SMS or a ticketing system integration or a pager if your company hasn't left the 90s yet. Um, that's an actual contact object where information is going to go somewhere. The other object, a contact object, is an actual user object. Uh, that's just a, simply a contact that's a stub for matching a login user. Why you're actually going to do this, I'll sort of get into a bit more. I think a few of you, some of the more advanced users, probably already know where this is headed. Uh, it contains no contact information. It never gets notified for anything. 
So let's begin with the contact definition. Uh, it's all pretty standard stuff. I dare say most of you have seen this 100 times before, so I won't dwell on it. We have a contact. It belongs to a contact group. It has an email. Uh, it has a template with all the sort of normal stuff you'd see in a template. Uh, and we have a contact group. Uh, I'm sorry, a, well, yes, a contact group that that user belongs to. Uh, now, you'll see that it's actually defined what the, where, uh, the relationship between the contact and the contact group in the uh, contact object. Does anyone want to hazard a guess at why that might be? Uh, OK, I'll take that as a no. Uh, the reason why we want to do that is automation. It's simply automation. It's also not so automation for these particular contact objects, though you may want to if a new particular distribution group gets created, you may want to automatically then create a contact object. It's a lot easier to do that and to modify uh, from the actual contact configuration because you can just dump that config file and then load that into XI. Or if you're just using Nagios Core, you can just dump the config file. You don't have to worry about extracting stuff from the database and then messing with it and then re-putting it into the database. Or you don't have to worry about opening up the contact group file and then trying to append things to a particular line. It's much simpler to just, you know, generate the contents of a file and put it down. Uh, so you'll notice there's also in the contact group there is a there is a, another contact group defined. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second when we talk about our user. So let's just assume we have a brand new Nagios setup, and as far as login is concerned, we're just using the HT password file, the standard Apache HT password file. Uh, now, we're going to pretend we have in that HT password file a user called bu-jsmurphy. That's just, you know, a login account that I type in my username and password, and I get into Nagios. So we'll create a contact called bujsmurphy, and we'll put that in the contact group BG team. And you'll see over here we have another template specifically for our users, which just basically says this will get nothing ever. This will never send a notification. It doesn't even have an email address. So what will happen is we'll take that BG team and we'll put that together with uh, our CG main that we saw before. Now, I'm assuming here that the actual email or SMS or what have you address that's attached to that CG main object is um, going to be related to a team of some sort. So let's say in this instance it's VG team. That's the team that's related to whatever email address it was we defined before. Um, now once we take that CG main and we attach it to you know a template or a service or whatever else you want to attach it to, we're going to get a bit of a flow-on effect. Because when a user logs on and it matches a contact object, then it will only allow that user to see the objects to which they have been assigned. This is a really cool feature of Nagios, and it's one that uh, most new users and even intermediate users find quite surprising when they first learn about it. Uh, it basically gives you the ability to do role-based access control in any other terminology or technology. Um, so I think that's a pretty cool feature, but we can sort of go one step further with this because who wants to create a, H, a user in the H, uh, HT password file, you know, for everyone who might potentially use Nagios, which in my case, that's sort of our entire IT department. So there's, a, there's quite a few people in there that, you know, need to log in and need to be able to see when stuff's down. So, uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, so we can actually go one step further, and this is for our um, core users. For XI, there's actually an LDAP and an AD plugin. You can just use that, and then this will make all the magic happen for you, and you don't need to worry about it. But for our core users, uh, if we can just use the Apache LDAP module and put in the information to connect to your dame, uh, domain controller and uh, tell it where it needs to find the users and all the other relevant information, you might want to create uh, an access group like I have down in the very bottom of that config. And when that user logs in with their LAN credentials, we can then match that to the user contact object. So now we've got that full flow in from 
AD authentication, Tanagios login, it'll go through, it'll match to a contact object, and then the user will only be able to see the objects to which their team has been given access to. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, I, I, I see like two people nodding and everyone else just sort of... Okay, so maybe it's mildly interesting and not pretty cool, but I, it's, I think it's good. So, uh, to summarize the contacts, distinguish between your users and your contacts. Uh, use an existing authentication source for your logins because you don't really need to define every individual contact. I assume most of you were doing that anyway. And consider the end user experience. It's very important that when they log in, they get the information they need uh, and that it's easy for them to find the devices that they need to work with because your hosts will only whinge when they're down. Your users will whinge because they're users. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about hosts. Uh, focus on minimizing host configuration to make automation easier. This is much the same as I talked about earlier uh, where we had the, uh, the contact group defined on the actual contact object. Uh, we just want to try to keep the, the host object as lean as possible so that we can just dump that config file without writing you know, too much information in it. Uh, use template, templates to assign the user view information. So attach that CG main in the templates because it's likely when it comes to the actual uh, physical devices, your hosts, your, uh, you know, your, your uh, network devices, all that sort of stuff, security devices, there's going to be probably a common owner for almost all of that. I mean, for us, there's the Linux guys own all the Linux servers, right? The Windows guys own all the Windows servers, and that's, you know, about 800, 900 odd devices right there between two teams. It's, it's likely that you'll have this sort of scenario in your average everyday sort of business setup. Uh, next, create host groups based on shared monitoring profiles. And what I, what I mean by that is that your Windows servers, they're all going to have a C drive, they're all going to have RAM and CPU and services, and you'll monitor all of those the same way, and it's likely that they'll all have the same threshold. Um, unless your architect's a mad genius and decided that he's just going to do whatever with you know, each of the drives, in which case you're in trouble, uh, for more than one reason, really. So. Try to, uh, try to create those, those shared profiles. You might also have them based on application. You have a lot of database servers. Again, they're all likely to be very similar. You might have, uh, and a, th a third option is locations. Your, your servers might differ based on vendor by location. So you might have Dell servers in like India and you might have HP in Australia and you, know, you might have something else somewhere else. Um, it's, it's a good way to sort of aggregate services and create the multi-tenancy layers between your hosts. So you might have something that's a Windows server and a database server and it might be in Hong Kong. So you might say, okay, it belongs to the Hong Kong group and databases and Windows and you can attach your services as you need and it'll just all flow down. It makes it much easier and allows you to really minimize and condense your amount of configuration. Uh, this is, is as opposed to the wizard, where if you use the wizard, there's a very good likelihood what it's going to do is create a host, and then it's going to create a whole bunch of services for that host. Now, suppose you do that for a few thousand devices, you're looking at massive, massive amounts of objects. I mean, for me, I think if I had done it that way, I would have somewhere in the area of around 50,000 config files. Instead, I have maybe, uh, like, sorry, I should say maybe about 50,000 service config files, right? Instead, I have maybe 200. Much, much leaner, much easier to work with when I need to move stuff around and change assignments. So, uh, this is uh, just an example of a host definition. Again, you've probably all seen this before. before. Uh, standard stuff in the service template. Uh, the host, we've kept in there the host name and the address. You'll see I've assigned a host name in both. I like host names better. 
IP addresses change, host names rarely change. And I just, I just prefer working with them. So up to you if you want to put the address in there as an alternative. It also allows me to be lazy with the macros and just use host address or host name, and it won't matter. Um, you'll see you have to find some parents, the host groups it belongs to, and this server's an exchange server and a Windows server. And you'll see our host group is virtually pretty much empty. I use host groups as pretty much an aggregation point for connecting hosts to services. So the host group itself remains more or less empty. So in summary for hosts, minimize configuration host objects to make automation easier. Host names allow for easier maintenance and IP addresses and create logical groupings that will make service assignment easier. Services. Uh, keep services as generic as possible to prevent the need for duplicate services. That's kind of uh, what I was talking about before when I said a very common scenario that I, that I see, particularly among newer users, is that they'll create a service, and once they've created a service, they'll create a ping, maybe 50 to 100 milliseconds. They'll create another one, 100 to 200 milliseconds, and then 200 to 300. The point is, even if that server that's 50 to 100, it like goes way out of proportion, gets to 120, uh, you're not going to see any impact. You're going to look at it. You're going to get the notification and look at it and think, well, that's nice, and just go back to whatever it is you're doing. It's not going to have any impact on your environment, and it's unlikely that you're going to care. The, something that allows you to really, really uh, prevent that overcomplication is try to look or try to get in the mindset of creating services at thresholds when the, you're going to see impact in your environment. And that's probably for ping, maybe two or three thousand. I mean, it might spike up for a little while to, you know, one thousand, but are you likely to see real impact? Not unless it's sort of in your core data center and it's between like your SAN and, you know, your virtual cluster. In that case, you're in real trouble. But in any other scenario, it's probably not going to have a massive impact, not immediately. So uh, next we want to minimize service templates to allow for easier management and baseline changes. Services are harder than hosts are to say what should go where. Uh, that's really going to depend a lot on your environment, and I'm not really going to be able to tell you. Uh, even for me, that sort of changes a little bit. But for me, I have a grand total of three service templates. because. All I use the service templates for is a way of gathering all those very common items that are almost the same for every single service. So the check intervals for a lot of our services are nearly the same. I mean, there's, there's really no need to differentiate the interval between how often I'm checking services or how often I'm checking the CPU. It's all, you know, roughly about 10 minutes does me just fine. You might find in your environment that's not the case, but the less, the more you can minimize that, it makes it way easier if, you do, if your company decides, well, we don't like 10 minutes anymore, we want five. So you can just change it in one place and you're done. Get on with your life. Um, so last of all, service groups tend to get really abused, and I mean just tragically abused, like lost kitten abused. People tend to take these these service ob uh, tend to take services and just bundle them into these service groups, just heaps of them that no one for any reason would ever use. When it comes to service groups, they are fantastic for taking applications and taking those components and binding them together into something useful. So you might have a front-end web server here, a back-end database here, some processing servers here. Take those little components that you're monitoring from that application and bundle them into a service group. That way, when your application team needs to break their application, you can just, they can just go to that service group and say, all right, maintenance. We're going we're gonna to mess with it a little bit. And it's much simpler for them, and it's much simpler for you, because you no longer have 500 of the things. Another time it's useful is if you need to roll out a new check to like every Windows server or something. Uh, I'd take all those, those new services, bundle them together, and as Nagia starts, I'd probably say disable alerting just to make sure something doesn't go tragically wrong. You don't flood your mailbox or something. Uh, and once you're happy that it's actually functioning as it should, 
uh, then you can uh, turn that off again. So this is an example service definition. There's really not that much to say here. We've got a service template. We've got max check attempts, retry intervals, and we've got our service, which Windows C usage and our Windows servers have C usage and our virtual Windows servers have C usage. So this check belongs to both of those. And we care about if it's above 80 or 90%. Uh, we can also see that CG main is defined here. Now the reason I do this on the actual service object rather than the template uh, is because these, the services I find change a lot who owns them. Hosts, not so much, but your actual services, I, on some servers I have 10 different owners on a single server, depending on which service it is. And this is, if you've been astute, you've probably noticed there's been these pretty little diagrams down the bottom. Uh, this is all of those little diagrams bundled together in one picture, and you'll see uh, something happens here. The contact is at the center of all this. The contact is the, the central object that we're working around. And the reason for this is, as I said earlier, your hosts, your hosts are going to go down, but if they're down, right? Your users are going to be the ones who say, but we need to see this, or we need to do that, or we need this. It's much easier if you centralize those users, then you can move that to whatever piece of the puzzle it is they're demanding access to. It really makes it easier to, because you can create a new kind of object, a new exception object, stick the user in that, and you know, it'll only take you maybe a couple of minutes to create those two extra objects, rather than sitting there and thinking, that's not going to work at all with all these templates I've defined. It's just, I can't do it. And I've run into that scenario before where I've trapped myself and someone's asked me to put something somewhere and I've thought, I just, there's no way for me to reasonably do that with the way I've actually laid out my config files. Not without uh, creating an unnecessary extra amount. So with services, try to strike a balance between your actual service definitions and your service templates. Uh, service groups are a very useful feature when used appropriately. Inappropriately, they're an administrative burden. Uh, and device lifecycle, oh, I didn't talk about this one. Okay, uh, device lifecycle happens. Something I see a lot of on the forums, and this is common among advanced users and basic users alike, is these massive Cthulian horrors of template, just layers and layers and layers deep of just these nested template objects. They are awful to look at. They are awful to change because they can have some terrible flow on effects. And imagine you're the next guy who has to work on that. I would probably just resign on the spot. <laughs> it's, you can usually get the same sort of functionality and maybe you have to have a little bit of duplication in maybe two or three layers. If you can keep it all in one, that's fantastic. That's great. But uh, you, know, you might need to, a couple of extra layers there. If you get to like 10, you might, you, might be, you might be in trouble, or the next person's gonna be in trouble because they are not gonna understand what's going on. Uh, so let's move on to the advanced topics. Uh, good parenting. So the first rule of parenting is to use parenting. The second rule of parenting is to use parenting. And the third rule of parenting is if this is your first time Nagios, using Nagios, you must parent. That's a Fight Club reference, by the way. Um, I felt like I should point that out for those who haven't watched it. Uh, so I see a lot of really silly reasons not to parent things, and there's never an excuse not to. This is my particular favorite, down the bottom here. Uh, this happens more than it should. Someone says, I've got a satellite office and I've got a head office, and I want to stop the flood of alerts when my satellite office goes down. So I sort of say, all right, well, why don't you take your satellite office and parent it to your head office? Oh, but we've got a, we've got a third party cloud provider that, you know, like an ISP that has all these network gear and I can't monitor them. And I'm like, okay, so don't. I, as far as you're concerned, if the network interface goes down on your head office or if it goes down on your satellite office or if it goes down somewhere in the middle at the service provider level, who are you gonna call anyway? It's probably gonna be your service provider regardless of, you know, what, where, uh, where that problem is. It's, it's, it's pretty simple stuff, but 
for some reason it gets overlooked quite regularly. Uh, now, with service dependencies, parent indirectly monitored services with service dependencies. That's a very abstract statement. Luckily, I have another three slides explaining it. So, indirect services. So, this is a very sort of typical ESX monitoring setup. We have the Nagios process, which will run check ESX3.pl, which is called something else now, but it was current when I wrote this some months ago. Um, that'll go and talk to the VMware API, and the VMware API will then go and talk to your vSphere cluster or your ESX server or your ESXi server. Now, that's all fine when that's working. Now, we're assuming that you're using a setup where you've sort of got a CPU and memory service or something attached to each one of your virtual hosts. We're assuming that kind of setup. So, Let's talk about what happens when that server fails. So, something like this is going to happen. You're going to be happy sitting there, you're going to lose connectivity, and then all of a sudden you're just going to get absolutely dumped on with a flood of emails. It doesn't need to happen like that. It's actually pretty simple to set up a service dependency that will prevent this sort of thing from happening. So, what we've got here is, is all very standard service dependency stuff because uh, you get the question, I need to make a set of services dependent on a host. And you can't actually create a dependency on a host, but you can create a ping to a host as a service. Alright, so we'll create that and then we'll go and make those CPU usage checks or those memory checks dependent upon that ping. And there we go, we have our host dependency. This is something that's, again, often overlooked and it's, it's not, not terribly difficult to set up. Managing exceptions. So even if you've created the most elegant, beautiful, uh, magnificent, simple, Nagios configuration the world has ever seen. And I'm talking, it's beautiful. Mr. Goldstadt himself walks in and sees it and just, there's tears in his eyes. It's a work of art, right? So, he, somewhere in your company, there is going to be this mean, unfeeling, cruel robot of a person who is going to come and he is just going to kick down your sandcastle. He is going to come up with a business case that is just going to ruin everything you've worked so hard for. When you come up with these situations, it becomes important to clearly label those exceptions in your configuration because you, you're going to need to do it. Um, you're better off when they come to you if you haven't got a clear idea in your mind how that you can make this reasonably scalable in the future to say, I don't quite have a way to implement that. Can you give me 24 hours or 48 hours and let me have a think about it? Get out a pen, get out a piece of paper and just sort of diagram the flow. I mean, like you would if you're an application programmer and you need to work out, you know, how you're going to fit in, you know, an extra function or what have you, or, you know, you need to add some, a new network device and you need to work out how you're going to set up the VLANs. You sort of begin by drawing just a very simple diagram for yourself, uh, I should think. <laughs> um, so, you follow that same sort of process. Make sure that when you do it, you can reuse that piece of information in the future. And once you get there, clearly label it as an exception to your normal thing. It's very important in Nagios that you have standard naming conventions. It makes it much easier to find objects when you get into the config manager and there's thousands of them. It makes it much easier to use that search box also to find what you're looking for. Um, especially if you need to find groups of stuff. So, it, it, can, be, it can be challenging, but take a little bit of time and you should be able to make it all right. Last of all, um, now rather than just go through this list uh, for automation, I'll tell you a little bit story, a little bit of a story about when I started at Kmart. When I started at Kmart, uh, I implemented Nagios Core, and I'd put in all the head office devices and all the servers, and I thought, cool, now I need to get to our stores. Now I need to begin importing sort of all those, all the network devices we have in stores. So I walked over to our our network department, and I said to them, 
good sirs, I would like a list of all your network devices, please. And they looked at me, and they sort of looked at each other, and they looked back at me, and they said, we don't have one. You see, over the last two decades of merging with companies and splitting with companies, all that sort of information, what was actually in a store, had just got completely lost along the way. That information just wasn't available anymore. So I was at a bit of a loss. How, how do I do that? How do I, how do I get that information? Uh, so I remember hearing that um, we used VoIP in our stores. And before I was a server engineer, I was a network engineer. And I knew that for our Vo uh, Cisco VoIP system, you needed to use CDP. So I wondered if the engineers who originally implemented this did the right thing and only implemented CDP on the end devices, or if they were lazy and just implemented CDP throughout the whole network. They were lazy. So I actually just got the CDP neighbor table from the router, and then I was able to see all the devices connected to it. Cool. So what I did was I wrote like a web crawler script, where instead of following links, it just basically gathers the CDP table, gathers all the devices, okay, I'll query them next. Who do you know? And from that, I was able to build a network map, and then I moved on to the next store, and built the network map for that store, and so on and so forth. Eventually, I had a list that no one had had in nearly a decade, a complete list of all the devices in our stores. Now, the point of this story, other than how incredibly clever I am, is that what is that there are a lot of unconventional ways that you can gather this information. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking. And there are so many data sources that you can potentially use. There are just heaps of them. And you can pretty much just pick your favorite three, and that'll give you probably 90% of your infrastructure. It doesn't take much. I personally believe scanning the IP address network range is sort of a bit of a sucker's game because there can be so much stuff in there and you don't know exactly what's what and you can't work you can't really reasonably work it out but if you've got same naming standards then your active directory will probably have computer accounts for all your servers so you can go and get use that to get the host names it's a good way to to get that sort of information and it's relatively relatively simple so that is the end of my presentation uh, are there any questions then I'll jump up at once. You must have done such an amazing job. You answered every question that uh, yeah. you just, they're, they're speechless. How about Nailed. a nice big round of applause once again?